Hello and welcome everyone to our second uh, PH Discuss webinar. Uh, today's topic uh, is, uh, is loneliness uh, an inevitable part uh, of the um, of a PhD. Uh, so I'll start by sharing my screen as well. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see it. So um, as I was saying, today's topic is loneliness, uh, uh, an inevitable part of a PhD. Um, first of all, we would like to thank uh, you all so much for being with us uh, again this evening. So good to see some familiar names uh, in the audience uh, from uh, our first webinar. And uh, once again, uh, we've been uh, uh, so overwhelmed uh, by the amount, first of all, of applicants for the panelist position, and as well uh, by the number of people uh, interested uh, in participating in this webinar as the audience. Uh, and uh, um, thank you so much for being here and taking time uh, off your busy uh, schedules uh, to join us. So uh, for those of you who doesn't know, um, PH Discuss, uh, it's a um, new um, webinar series uh, created by uh, three students, three PhD students uh, uh, from the CDT in Advanced Biomedical Materials uh, at the University of Manchester. Uh, these three students uh, are Lionel Gini, um, Robert Bakri, and myself, Davide Verdolino. And uh, the aim of this webinar series uh, is uh, to create a comfortable uh, and safe uh, um, environment uh, uh, to discuss sensitive topics related to equality, diversity, and inclusion within the uh, research community that may affect uh, uh, PhD students uh, um, during their doctorate. Uh, and um, we aim to uh, provide uh, advice uh, um, and ideas uh, on how to uh, tackle these issues. Uh, uh, today, we have uh, a diverse panel uh, of researchers with us uh, to share personal experiences uh, uh, from their academic journey. And uh, our panelists will be discussing whether loneliness uh, is uh, actually an embedded part uh, of a PhD, or is it something uh, that um, is um, from uh, that arise from uh, the um, academic uh, environment. Uh, uh, before I introduce the panel, uh, I'd like to go over some uh, uh, quick uh, housekeeping. So uh, for those of you who haven't already done so, please remember to turn off uh, your camera and microphones. Also to uh, be able to see the panelists uh, um, all on your screen, you can uh, um, either non-video participants. So you just click on the arrows uh, uh, with the camera, go on video settings, and then toggle on uh, either non-video participants. And uh, as well, select gallery view um, in your options uh, in the top right corner of your screen. Uh, so you can see all of uh, uh, the people involved in the panel uh, when we start the discussion. Um, also, please feel free to use the chat box, box uh, um, to send in your questions or comments, uh, um, but uh, be careful that the chat is closed during the uh, discussion so the panelists won't be able to see your uh, messages, but we'll, make it, um, we'll open it uh, once the Q&A starts uh, and uh, we open the conversation to you, the audience. So um, one final note is that the webinar is recorded. Uh, of course, um, none of your um, cases uh, and names uh, will be shared. Uh, so with that, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our panel of four speakers today. And uh, um, we have uh, Dr. Eva Fusiniska, um, she is a psychology neuroscientist and founder of PhD su Success. After obtaining a PhD in cognitive psychology, followed by 
the postdoctoral experience in human neuroscience, uh, Eva created an online uh, platform dedicated to mental health uh, and well being uh, of PhD candidates uh, called PhD Success. Through individual consultation, supportive community, and training, uh, Eva helps PhD candidates to become more confident, productive, and happier researchers. Uh, by combining her passion for helping people of knowledge in psychology and academic experiences, Eva uh, aims to create a happier and healthier academic culture. Then uh, we have uh, Jamie Koo. Um, Jamie has just completed her PhD on uh, women's responses to contemporary beauty and body ideals, uh, having been actively involved uh, with PGR community throughout her PhD, she has now started her own PhD coaching and training consultancy to help researchers deal uh, with the messier part uh, of uh, the PhD process uh, and discover more joyful, uh, peaceful ways uh, of working. She believes strongly in the importance of community throughout the PhD journey and has started the Messy PhD Facebook group uh, to offer researcher greater support, friendship, and training. Um, then we have uh, uh, Price Billy Arianto, um, an amateur musician who loves science, is how Billy describes himself. is a first PhD uh, candidate uh, with research on music and executive function, fully funded by the Indonesian Endowment Fund for Education. Back in his country, he is a lecturer in the Faculty of Psychology at Manjaya Catholic University of Indonesia. And last but definitely not least, we have uh, Jamie Lee Jenkins. Uh, Jamie is an external PhD candidate at Bradbound University in the Netherlands and the University of Sheffield. Jamie's academic work investigates popular expectation uh, of democracy in Great Britain between the end of the Second World War and the 1980s. Uh, her work focuses uh, on the media, specifically tabloid, newspapers, uh, um, popular participation, and uh, democracy. Jamie's key research interests uh, are British political culture in the post-war period, the interaction between me the media and politics, uh, and the social history of Britain in the latter half uh, of the 20th century. Uh, with that done, I uh, welcome Eva, um, Jamie Koo, Jamie Jenkins, uh, and uh, Billy. First of all, thank you all for uh, taking the time to discuss this very important topic, uh, and uh, um, mostly considering the global situation that we're currently living. Uh, it's been great working with you all and learning from uh, your experiences. So I'll now hand over to um, Leona, who will be moderating uh, the discussion part uh, of today's webinar. Hello, Leona, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. As Davide said, we're really excited to have this webinar and really excited to hopefully help you all and give some advice that you'll find useful today. So feeling lonely and feeling isolated during your PhD is a really common and normal reaction to the setup of most, um, most PhD programmes. However, despite being a common feature of the PhD experience, feelings of loneliness and isolation are rarely discussed openly in the academic environment. So in the wake of COVID-19, social isolation caused by social distancing measures, university closures and travel bans have left many of our students feeling more lonely than ever as the tools that we used to use to combat loneliness, like societies and face-to-face -face lab group meetings, are no longer available to us. So today, we've come together to make a space to openly discuss the impacts of loneliness on us as PhD students and what can be done to help manage this. So before we jump into the webinar, into the discussion portion, I'd like to start by getting you guys in the audience involved with a poll. So this should be popping up on your screens right now. And our first poll question is, do you think loneliness is an inevitable part of a PhD? So we'll give the answers at the end of, after the first question. But I'd also like to put this question to our panelists. So hi guys, hi panelists. 
So here's the, let's go for it. That here's the big question. Is loneliness an, un, an inevitable feature of a PhD? Let's start with Eva. Yes, hello. Well, for me, what research shows on mental health in academia is that loneliness is there. It is a part of the PhD and it has a huge impact on our mental health, on our well-being, and also on our academic performance. Now, in my opinion, that can be avoided. Um, and um, But it's not something that just disappears like that. I think that it really requires us to take action and to invest time and energy. And fighting loneliness can be something affordable. So we really need to give it an important attention and energy. And I think that also it starts from the actions like yours, like PhD discussed, to talk about it and break the taboo. So very happy to be here, by the way. Uh, I think like uh, maybe I just like jumping through the Eva's comment. Uh, I think in my opinion, yes, it is. Uh, it is like avoidable, but I think like it's like inevitable actually <laughs> because like uh, I don't know maybe because I'm an international student, I'm far away from home, and sometimes like the feeling of homesick is coming, uh, and then like. Uh, I talk like with the other PhD students, especially like other international students, uh, and they said like uh, in like different phase of like their milestone in the PhD, like they feel like lonely. So that's why I was thinking like, although like I'm a first year student, I also feel like lonely. And I think like, yeah, maybe like at some point, like we will feel lonely, but yes, I know that it can be avoided, but it's inevitable that maybe at some point of our PhD, like we will feel lonely. That's what I thought. <laughs> Can I jump in at this point? Um, so I think it's really important, just kind of following up from what Billy has just said. Um, I think it's really important to make a distinction between aloneness, being alone, and loneliness. Um, and yes, you know, a lot of parts of the doctoral journey and doing PhD research is done alone, it's done in isolation, even for people who are working on um, project teams. Um, you know, your own work for your own PhD is usually done alone. Um, a lot of it is done on, you know, by yourself. Um, but I don't think we need to necessarily assume that doing research alone means that you are going to be lonely. Um, and I actually think that aloneness and learning to embrace being alone can actually be a good thing. Um, and aloneness can actually be a good quality and harnessed in positive ways. So it's a way, for example, of kind of really developing self-sufficiency, um, learning to kind of really appreciate our own company and really taking advantage of that space that you have to explore your own interests, your strengths, um, to gain a better understanding of yourself. And that inevitably will feed back into doing better, more reflective research, I think. Yeah, I think for me, before I started my PhD, I asked other PhDs about their experiences, how they'd found it. And a big thing was, if you do a PhD, you're gonna be lonely. This is gonna be a very isolating experience. And I, they really scared me, to be honest. And it kind of put me off wanting to follow, the, follow that route. And it wasn't because I didn't love my subject and want to go down that like, route in that course. It was the fear of being lonely. And I think that whilst having started, and I do think that loneliness is a part of it, I don't think that it's inevitable. And I think that by sort of saying it's inevitable and just being like, this is ingrained as part of doing a PhD, it kind of lets institutions off the hook. Like they don't have to really do much about it. It's just part of it. And you kind of have to accept it if that's what you want to do. And I don't, I don't think we have to do that. I think actually there's stuff that we can do, there's stuff institutions can do to really support us and help get rid of that loneliness that's part of it. Guys, it's, it's really interesting hearing what you have to say because Although your answers are slightly different, I think the one thing you can all agree on is that, yes, you know, you, there are times when you feel lonely during your PhD experience, but it doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do about it. And hopefully we'll be discussing some of these things that you can do about it later on in the discussion. But for now, let's look at the results from our first poll. So they should be popping up on the screen. Um, so... Oh, so it looks like we have a bit of a split, <laughs> just like on our panel. 
but the majority of the people of the people in the audience think that yes it is an inevitable part of the phd okay so let's keep the conversation flowing <laughs> like to put another question to the panelists um, what do you think causes loneliness during the PhD? And also what, um, what are the impacts of loneliness on PhD performance? Maybe if we start with Christ Billy this time. Okay, so in my opinion, well, I'm a bit surprised that a lot of people feel the same way with me. Like majority <laughs> of the people feel that, yes, like feeling lonely is like inevitable. And I think like the main cause of the loneliness is because like the feeling that nobody understand you, especially because like doing this PhD, well, many people say that like it's a lone wolf. For example, when, when I'm talking about like my research, like, okay, I'm, I'm doing a research in music and executive functions. And like, uh, is there any relationship between music and executive function? And what is actually executive function? Like nobody, not all people know what is executive function. And I feel like, like, uh, I'm not being understandable by other person. Like nobody, I feel like nobody understand me and I'm confused. Like who should I talk with that will understand me? So that's why I think like that's one cause of the loneliness. And maybe the other thing is because, because like I live abroad alone and also like in this pandemic situation where it's very hard to have like a social life. Like I cannot go outside like freely. And yeah, I think like that's the cause of the loneliness that I feel like, uh, happened to me and what uh because of the loneliness itself like I feel like demotivated I feel like uh uncomfortable with myself like uh I don't feel like doing my PhD because there is something's wrong with me and I have I have this kind of negative emotion that makes me demotivated but I know that I still have to keep going with my PhD so sometimes like I just force myself that I have to do this because it's my work so <laughs> Yeah, I am. Um, I definitely agree with that. I definitely think that part of the part of the problem is when you want to talk about it and you want to share your ideas and stuff, it can be difficult to know who to talk to and where to go to get people that understand your research, understand what you're doing to the level that you do. And um, I think for me as well, though, that sort of the academic culture does really feed into this idea of loneliness. I think this idea of competition rather than collaboration. Um, and not not sort of wanting you to have these discussions and then feeling then that it's a taboo to say, actually, I'm struggling here, I'm feeling lonely. Um, I think that that culture really feeds into that. And then I think because, because you do think that being lonely is this inevitable part of the PhD and it's like, well, I've signed up for this. So if I'm feeling lonely, then am I kind of admitting failure and admitting defeat in this PhD more generally? So I do think that a lot is to do with sort of the culture and this competitive, every person for themselves environment that's surrounded with, with academia. Yeah, can I jump in on that as well? I think a lot of loneliness is also, everything that Billy and, and Jamie Jenkins has already covered is exacerbated by not having adequate supervisory support or departmental or institutional support. Um, I mean, it's bad enough not being able to talk to your peers um, about your research. And in many cases, even people within your department are not going to fully understand what you're doing because everyone has their own specialisms. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if you are in the same department, your your focus could be completely like different worlds. Right. Um, and I think it's even worse if and this is something I've heard a lot from from colleagues, from peers, that's PhD students that I've worked with. Um, the greatest sense of loneliness, I think, is also not getting support from the very person who should have your back, who is your supervisor, um, and not, you know, not being understood by them either. And I'm not just talking about being understood in, in the sense of your academic work, um, but also just being understood as a, as a person, you know, what you're going through in that journey. Um, and a lot of supervisors don't take the, that time or that or invest that effort to understand what is going on in that student's life um, which can feel then really alienating because then you know whatever is going on in your life is impacting what's going on in your research and if there isn't anyone that you can really talk to about that and trust that they have your back um, that's going to stall your progress in terms of your academic work. You know, if things aren't going right in your life, they're not gonna go right in your work either. So I think it's really about having that, that level of support from sort of higher up. So it's not just peer support, but adequate institutional and departmental and supervisory support as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, maybe I I will jump in as well, just to summarize, because actually everything that you have said, I am fully with you and I totally agree. And when I was actually creating a PhD success community, so the online community actually to fight with loneliness, I came back really to the beginnings, to the reasons why we feel so lonely during the PhD. And I came up with four reasons and actually you you just said it here. So one of them is like lack of understanding of the topic of what is PhD from our family, from our old friends. I think that this is extremely frustrating and that was my case as well. Like everyone was very proud that I'm doing PhD, but no one knew what I was doing exactly. Then the other thing is also like uh, isolation in your lab, the competition. So that can be due to the competition, due to the academic culture, due to also the atmosphere that your supervisor may set up for you. Uh, but also simply isolation by the or loneliness by the topic, because sometimes like very often it's you and your research. And sometimes very often actually we're working on very, very specific things. So by itself, it can be um, isolating because we cannot share the same methods or discuss the results. Then the other thing that I also feel sometimes is the geographical isolation. So PhD students that are the only PhD student at the laboratory, or they are like extremely far away in a very small universities where there is no academic community, PhD community. And then and yet another, I think very important factor is also time. We also need to invest time in to build friendships, to build relationships. And we don't have much time during PhD. And sometimes it also doesn't feel just easy to give this time to building relationships, whereas there is loads of work waiting for us. Thanks, guys. I was actually, I was smiling and smiling and laughing along a bit when you guys talked about be being misunderstood or people not understanding, like your family members, because I'm a first gen PhD student and talking about with my, my PhD with my family members doesn't really go much beyond I'm in the lab today because <laughs> they're not going to get it. So I could definitely relate to that. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. Um, I've got a question for Jamie Koo, actually. Um, as someone who coaches PhD students with the messy PhD, why do you think it is that so many of us struggle to talk openly about loneliness? Okay, so I first of all, I think loneliness often gets bound up in with other anxieties and other insecurities and fears. So fear, the fear of judgment for not coping, um, either in our academic work or in our private lives, fear of judgment for not being social enough. And, you know, contemporary, modern, and mostly Western societies really favor extroverts, right? It favors people who are confident, who put themselves out there, who, um, who make friends easily, and who always seem to be on top of things. And it, especially now with social media and that kind of, um, the way people kind of curate their, their public image as being on top of everything all the time. Um, I think, you know, not just, it's not just within an academic context, but more broadly in culture and society, there are these increasing pressures to be co confident, to be productive, to be resilient. And I really hate the word resilient because it, I feel like it, it it's like a, a forced kind of confidence that we're trying to uh, cultivate in in our students. Um, there's this, you know, the, the, the Nike just do it kind of philosophy of of toxic positivity. I think like, it's, you know, you, you feel that you must be on the ball all the time. There's like proactive fix it culture, you know, like um, if there's something wrong, it's up to you to fix it. So then there's the, the 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 anxieties compound because then not only do you feel lonely but then you feel the pressure of not having been able to fix it as well so you feel then it all the anxieties kind of double and triple and, and quadruple because it's not just loneliness then that you're dealing with you're dealing with the sense of failure the sense of not being productive the sense of not being confident enough not being happy enough um 
And I think that makes it extremely difficult to talk about and, and even to untangle in the first place, you know, what actually is the root problem? Um, where is it all coming from? Because again, like I said, loneliness gets bound up in with a lot of these other anxieties and, and insecurities and fears. And, and society and, and culture itself doesn't really encourage that kind of um, vulnerability and, and being able to talk openly about these issues because you know you're kind of told to just love yourself, empower yourself, just do it. <laughs> you know, but how? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that's really why it is so difficult to talk about. Yeah, I definitely it is definitely something that is hard to talk about. I mean, I'm a, I'm a I'm speaking as the moderator on this panel and I've definitely had times where I felt lonely over the past year and looking back I don't think I've spoken to anyone about it so it's good that we're able to have this discussion here today. Yeah absolutely now, even think, in lockdown you know you see lots of things of like people talking about oh well I've picked up this skill and I'm doing this thing now and I'm doing lots of zoom like champagne nights with my friends and <laughs> and so you know that's good it's good to like to see that people are coping with it in different ways but then it does also inadvertently put pressure on you to be doing the same thing when actually all you want is to have a little cry and be able to tell someone that you're lonely you know <laughs> and, and thinking about it now just as my own difficulties about speaking about this I'm just thinking of you know Christ Billy as the male panelist on this webinar how it may be if it's difficult for me as a woman is there a, is there a different is there a further difficulty for men specifically to speak up about the admission of loneliness um so what i put that to christ billy actually do you think okay. there are difficulties specifically for men speaking up on this issue okay i think like uh in my opinion like because like there is like this expectation that male should be tough male should be like strong and i guess like sometimes like talking about like their feeling it shows that you are vulnerable and i think like that is not that is not something that is favorable on male so that's why i think like for male sometimes like it it is like harder to for us to uh share like our feeling and sometimes like when i talk with my friends uh uh what they say is like you should like embrace like your loneliness and you should just keep going on like working on the uh working on your phd instead of like thinking about like your feeling and i think like that's not good because like i think like we should embrace our feeling first we should feel comfortable with our self before we can actually work with our phd and i think like that is i don't know maybe it's part of my culture like because like in indonesia i feel it that way like male should be like tough or something or maybe i don't know it's like male stuff that we uh it's not something that we usually tell what we feel so yeah that's what i think what's what makes like men uh harder to say about like what they feel yeah, it's interesting that you brought um, the cultural element in there and, you know, about how a man should feel or should portray himself, because I'm sure there are many different cultures that we have in the audience today who will relate to this, you know, this cultural struggle of speaking openly as a man about how you feel about things. Um, but I think it's time for our second poll to make sure the audience are, are still there, still engaged. So that should be popping up on your screens now. And the question is, do you feel comfortable talking about loneliness with your peers? So we'll have those results later. So the C word has come up a few times already in this discussion, COVID-19. And I think it would be impossible for us to have this webinar on loneliness without acknowledging the impacts of COVID over the last year or so. So a recent study by Dr. Fei-Fei Bu from the Department of Behavioral Science and Health at UCL found that being a, stu being a student was a higher risk factor for loneliness during lockdown than usual. So for the PhD students on the panel, Price, Billy and Jamie and Jamie, how has COVID-19 impacted your PhD life in terms of loneliness and relationships? So when, so I started my PhD during lockdown. So we started in September. Um, so it's kind of just defined my whole PhD experience so far. So I've, I mean, the table that I'm sat on now is where I'm eating my tea. It's where I'm doing my PhD work. Like this has pretty much been it. Um, so yeah, it has been difficult and it has been quite lonely. Um, so my PhD is based 
at Radboud University, which is in the Netherlands. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to go yet, so I've not been able to meet my team, which, um, which has been really difficult. And luckily, I'm part of a fantastic team, and we have like weekly Zoom meetings, and we like contact each other as regularly as possible. But it, it's difficult without having that sort of in-person contact, without being able to bounce ideas off each other, and just just not so you just sat on your own in a room all day. It's having having a little bit of difference, having conversation. So yeah, it has it has been a challenge. I think not only in terms of not being able to access the archives, not being able to go out, but but your mental health as well. It's that that has been really difficult. And I think that I've struggled to get motivation a lot of the time. Um, and normally, so during my masters, that motivation would come from having these conversations and talking to people about this. And it ha it has made it very difficult to do that. So although I've found like things to do during COVID, so obviously like online meetings have been great, but the Zoom fatigue is real. And sometimes it would just be nice to be able to go for a coffee with someone and not be talking over a computer screen. Um, but I like, I've enjoyed, I enjoy the work and I enjoy the content of my PhD, but it's definitely tainted my experience. I think it's such a shame that this first year will kind of be defined by being stuck inside and being very isolated. Yeah, I think like I feel the same way with Jamie because like I also started like last October, which means like I also started during the pandemic. And unfortunately, I have to start my PhD like from Indonesia, which is like a seven hours time difference from the UK. And I think like it's very hard because uh, because of the time differences. I mean, like when all of the people like in the UK are still working, I'm I'm like preparing to go to sleep actually, but I but I have to adapt with like the timetable because uh, my supervisor is really supportive and she is like, uh, okay, I can just like uh, adapt with your schedule so I can have like the meeting like uh, in the in the morning uh, in the morning UK time, which is like the afternoon in the Indonesia time. And yeah, it's really hard to have like that kind of like time differences while working with the PhD. And also I feel the same way with Jamie about like, uh, usually like when we are in the, the department, like we have like, uh, we bump to other person. We just like talk and have this small chat, but we can't, we can't do that because like I'm in this small room here and then just work on my PhD. And also like, uh, it's really hard for me uh, when it comes to like, when I have to, uh, to be like in the UK. Uh, because like usually when we want to go abroad, like we have like this farewell party, we say goodbye to our friend. But unfortunately, can I cannot have this proper goodbye with my friends. And then I remember like I just sent the message when I was in the airport and and, and sent it like, hey, I'm in the airport, like uh, I'm going to go like soon. Like oh yeah, sorry we cannot go be there. Like well that's good because of this pandemic, like you shouldn't be outside. <laughs> like you cannot go with me and. Yeah, and I think like that's the sad part of like uh, going abroad with nobody knows that you're abroad actually because like of this pandemic. But well, luckily like we can have we can still have like the uh, video call. We, I can still text, although because like the time differences and the busy schedule sometimes it's like the delay of like uh, the delay of uh, replying the message and finding this the schedule is really hard when I want to talk with my friends, with my family in Indonesia. So yeah, that's what I feel. <laughs> uh, so I'm on the other end of the spectrum because I've literally just finished my PhD. So I do have that advantage of already having my, my people and, and my community around me. Um, but, you know, for Jamie and Billy and for all of you who are new to the PhD and you've just started in the last, like, six months or so, um, I, I want to reassure you that there is hope. There is, you know, even though I'm at the end of my PhD, over the last year when I was working on my PhD corrections, which was a very difficult time, um, I was still able to make friends online. So um, I know it's a very different way of interacting, um, but it doesn't, that ne doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Um, I think actually now, because you want to limit your time online, right? Because Zoom fatigue is a real thing and, and it, it gets a bit much. I think because of that, then you end up being more intentional with your friendships and with the the things that you attend. Um, I've certainly found that with myself, I've become a lot more intentional with who I choose to spend my time with. 
um, I, it's been a really good opportunity to kind of reassess and, and really think about my friendships, my relationships, who is uplifting um, and who's just an unnecessary drag on my life. Um, and in, in a way it can, it can be good for people who are sort of more introverted or people who find um, socializing very draining or lonely even. So uh, people who are neurodiverse, who are introverted, who are highly sensitive. Um, it's, a, it's a different way of interacting. Um, and yeah, you know, we're missing out on a lot of physical interaction, but just for someone who did that in the first, you know, six months of my PhD, that can also be um, a whole other kind of unpleasantness you know you feel kind of this pressure to perform to be out there to network um, you end up meeting a lot of people who may not necessarily be encouraging at all to to your PhD I met a lot of people like that I was meeting a lot of people high, sort of higher up or further along in the PhD who told me all kinds of really discouraging things and um, because you're physically there with them, it feels a little bit more difficult to disengage. So there are different pressures, I think, of, of physical interaction and different things that you can do online that you can't physically. Um, so, yeah, I think actually because, you know, we're, we're more careful about where we spend our time online and who we spend it with, you can actually end up creating some really good, really sound friendships and, and really good new connections because you're being more intentional with it and not just being like thrown out into like every other social that's out there on campus and kind of getting lost in the fray. Yeah, but yeah, just re to reassure you, you know, even at the end of my PhD, I'm still making good friends um, and, and having really good conversations with people that I've actually never met in real life. And I feel like, oh, we're, like, we're actually good friends now. So it's not like, not all hope is lost. Like it's definitely possible to still be forging good, good connections in this time. Oh, I really like that answer, Jamie. It's because I think when we think of COVID-19 and COVID-19 impacts, immediately, immediately you default to thinking about negatives and how it's made life worse or things worse. But I'm true, I feel like if we all sit down, I'm sure there's some positive that we can pull out of this situation. And, you know, the, the more in intentional interactions and conscious interactions that you highlighted there is definitely something I can connect with and resonate with in terms of my friendship. Um, right, I think we'll have the poll answers from the second poll, please, Rob, which should be popping up. So do you feel comfortable talking about loneliness with your peers? It looks like the most common answer is slightly uncomfortable, with slightly comfortable as the second most common answer. So once again, we have a split audience. But I'd just like to thank the audience for your engagement, because we've actually got 96% 96, uh, 96 participation in the polls. So thank you for engaging and keep doing so. I think we've got another poll coming up for you shortly. OK. So I've got a question for Eva this time. Eva, as a PhD graduate and founder of PhD Success, a platform dedicated to mental health support and the well-being of PhD candidates, what are some helpful strategies to battle loneliness during the PhD that you can give to our audience today? Yeah, <laughs> well, in the normal times, I would say just go out Try to attend as many events as you can, join PhD students, associations, trainings, really surround yourself by like-minded people who are living similar experience as you do. Um, it doesn't have to be the same topic, it doesn't have to be the same field, but just people who really understand your challenges and going, who are going in the same pace. Well, nowadays <laughs> with COVID and the situation, I think it's it's really, uh, really difficult to connect this way and I mean really big appreciation for Jimmy and uh, Jimmy and Billy for starting their PhD in, in such times I think it's pretty unique experience that you're living right now uh, but I still think that it is possible to to make connections and to meet like-minded people also online so this is also one of the reasons I created PhD success community so this is a safe space where we actually work together, but we also talk about 
productivity, about mental health, but also simply love, exercise, <laughs> whatever. So we also have this just social uh, social contact, social exchange while, while working together. So this is definitely uh, possible right now. Another technique that I would also like, well, technique a point to highlight here is also to maintain your past relationships your relationships with your friends with your family who do not have the peace necessary and who will help you in the future to put your peace also in a perspective and they are also your support they are also there for you not to feel lonely and uh, and yet another um, and yet another important point is that our life is not only PhD limited. So <laughs> it's also very important to nurture our hobbies and our non-PhD identity. And so I will also encourage you to find another group of people, friends, uh, who will you share a similar hobby. So for example, me, I did online dancing classes and that was really fun. And I also met new people. So I think it's more important like to have one link, something in common so you can share it and also around yourself this way. Yeah, it's funny because as you mentioned the you know online communities, I was thinking about um, you guys on the panel and actually Eva, you and Jamie, I met through an online Facebook group for PhD support for, PhD, for support for PhD students and right. Jamie um, Jenkins as well I knew through Instagram so definitely I've got a point to highlight there for our audience online communities are great for support networks and, and speaking to people who will understand what you're going through um, let's open this up to the rest of the panel actually um, to the rest of the panelists what are some helpful strategies you found to battle loneliness during your PhD I think um, I really like Eva's point about like sort of that nourishing the you outside your PhD I think that's been really really important and uh, a lot of it has been me having to like push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit because doing everything over Zoom and online feels very awkward. It feels quite unnatural and joining any like new club or starting anything new is daunting enough anyway. But I think doing it online and having that that challenge there that your Wi-Fi might not work or that something might go wrong is just a whole other stress. So I think that it's been like really pushing yourself out of the comfort zone. But I've tried to join like uh, book clubs, like online yoga classes. Um, like my gym have set up like online classes so it's just been really trying and even though some nights after you've been on your computer all day you're like I, I really can't be bothered like I do not want to go on the zoom and have another zoom meeting it's, it's putting yourself out there and doing it and I found that be, that's been really really helpful Um, I also think that a big thing for me is just having like these candid conversations so being able to talk like this being having a team that I'm able to talk to about this Um, luckily I've got a supervisor who I'm able to openly discuss these feelings with and I just think that being honest about how I'm feeling has been massive because knowing that other people are in the same boat and knowing you're not alone in feeling lonely really does help sort of alleviate a lot of that um I do think though a lot of the like emails and stuff that you get at the minute is like, go outside for walks make banana bread and I think that it gets to a certain point where like don't feel that you can't then seek help if these things aren't aren't enough then it's there's options and routes that you can go and you can seek help and get support for it um and it's not just it's not just on you going out for a walk and doing things there are other avenues you can take if you do need that support yeah and i th uh actually like i like what jamie said because like uh, i also feel the same way like uh maybe because like we just started like in the same phase in this uh, middle of the pandemic and i agree i also agree with eva talking about like uh like we should do like we should embrace like activities like outside like our phd because i uh, as as uh, as like david has mentioned like i'm a musician i play the music and also like it helps me a lot actually to do my hobby and to do what i like and talking with another friends i'm making like small kind of like phd support group which is like with my friends and we always talk about like some things like outside like our phd and also like for my personal actually my personal top tips is like uh, during this pandemic like I like to do like the mindfulness meditation and I think like it's really helpful because like we're doing like mindfulness meditation like we uh, we can like evaluate like ourselves like we can reflect what happened with ourselves like 
uh, if there is like a hollow feeling in our heart, like we can feel it when we're doing like this mindfulness meditation, and we acknowledge that we we don't we uh, we don't like abandon it, but with but we acknowledge that we cope with that, and after we finish, like we finish with ourselves, and uh, I feel like I feel calmer after I do the mindfulness meditation. I can just. I feel like less lonely afterward, or maybe like if I feel really lonely, I just like contact with my friends and ask them like, okay, I just want you to listen to me. Like I don't need solution. I just need someone to listen to me. And I think like that way of co- coping is like uh, really helpful for me to uh, to go through this loneliness phase. And especially like during this pandemic, which is really hard actually. So yeah. <laughs> And just out of interest, what platforms are you using for your mindfulness that you mentioned there? Oh, yeah. For me, like I use Headspace, actually. If if you ever use the Headspace, like the like the the person who talk, uh, I think like his name is Andy, Andy Pukom. Like he's really calming, you know, like his voice is like, uh, keep, uh, okay, just imagine something. It feels like, oh, okay, when I listen to that, it feels like, oh, I feel really calm. It feels like soothing. So it helps me a lot to do the mindfulness meditation. So Headspace is, I recommend Headspace to be used for the mindfulness meditation. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to jump in. Um, this is something kind of a little bit different from what's already been said. Uh, and it might not be for everyone, but just maybe give it a go. And so what I wanted to suggest was also like n- not to be afraid to just contact people directly. So, you know, if, you, if you're seeing someone's work on Twitter or on social media um, or even, you know, through conferences or, or panels like this, don't be afraid of just contacting people directly and just saying hello and saying, you know, you're you're interested in their work or maybe there's overlaps in your research and you'd like to get to know each other a bit more. Um, I think we're, we, we fear each other, you know, and we're scared that, you know, so-and-so is so much further along in their journey. They're not going to want to have to pay attention to us, but actually all of us are, are kind of in the same journey. We're in this together and more often than not, academics are actually friendly and they are actually you know they're wanting to talk to other academics everyone is kind of in the same boat especially with what's happening in the world now so yeah don't be afraid of reaching out to people really just send an email slide into people's dms um it can feel a little bit intimidating at first but i promise like the majority of people if not every single person that i've reached out to has always reached back favorably um, and, you know, there's always going to be one or two people who are a bit arsy and who won't won't entertain you. But that's I mean, that's going to happen everywhere, I think. But, yeah, it, give it a shot. Don't be afraid. And people are, are nicer and friendlier than we give each other credit for, I think. So, yeah, send me an email if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we've got lots of brilliant advice um, from the panelists there. I hope the audience will benefit from that. I guess to summarise, we've got online communities, engaging in activities outside your PhD that energize you and and enrich you. We've got mindfulness and meditation. And we've also got not being afraid to just contact people and and speak openly about how you feel, sending people a message and, you know, talking to each other. Okay, so I think we've got, it's time for our final poll question. Let's see if we can get 100% audience participation this time, guys. (laughs) And the final question is, have you ever used your university or institution's mental health and well-being services? So we'll have those answers later. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about the impacts and causes of loneliness in the discussion so far, and what we can do ourselves as PhD students to try and combat this. So I'd like to conclude this in-panel discussion portion of the webinar by asking each of our panelists, you know, in your experience, do you think there needs to be more support offered to PhD students from institutions and supervisors? Yeah, I'll um, jump in with that. So I think, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that we, we can't really let universities and institutions off the hook with it. I think that a lot of the initiatives that I've seen set up about COVID, which have been fantastic, have been student led. So there's been um, coffee mornings, they've been like mini conferences, you can share papers and they've been great. They've been a great way for me to kind of meet 
a PhD team that otherwise I wouldn't have had the opportunity to connect with. Um, but I think that most of these have been student led initiatives. And I, I think that we, there's a lot that institutions can be doing and should be doing to offer support. I think that them running the conferences and organizing maybe like accountability groups, just kind of bringing us together, having more social events and just being more candid about these sort of conversations and trying to break down that sort of stigma and this competitive academic culture that that's out there and that's going on. I think that by being able to point people in the right direction and having these open conversations, um, no, so students know where they can go to support for support. They've got support that isn't just their supervisor if they don't feel they have that sort of relationship with them. I think it's massively important. And I think that if we just say that PhD loneliness and PhD life is inevitable, it really does let them off the hook when really there's a lot that they need to be doing to, to help out. Yeah, I want to I want to add on to that. So, you know, there are lots of student led initiatives at the moment, which is great. Um, but yeah, I think if we expect students to start doing that, it places the burden of student well being on students themselves. Um, and also, you know, how confident or supported students feel to be able to create those kinds of events or activities or to speak up about their needs um, does start by the kind of culture of the departments and the institutions and, and the project leads that are that kind of oversee them. You know, remember that there are going to be a lot of people who are more introverted and who will not feel as confident or able to initiate or even to join events. And I think that culture, fostering that culture of togetherness, of community really has to be set by the departments, by, by higher up. Um, and I say this because so much of, of what postgraduate researchers are struggling with, you know, loneliness, anxiety, ailing mental health among PhD students start from the fact that structures and, and systems in institutions are becoming more and more concerned with research output rather than on the well-being and the personal development of individuals. Um, you know, so the, the, the reason we're in this state at the moment where students are feeling lonely and isolated and anxious and, and suffering all these mental health issues, it starts because of the, the, the broader structural and systemic problems. So I think, you know, if we're going to solve it, it, it can't just be the students. Students fixing it is just a Band-Aid over, over a saw. You know, I think it really has to come from institutions. And, you know, a happy, a happy researcher who is thriving and happy and well-balanced and, and enjoying well-being in other aspects of, of their life is what will lead to good research and, and productive research. So I think, you know, a supervisor's job shouldn't just be academic. It should, it should include pastoral care and a willingness to meet their students, not just as, you know, this, this machine that's churning out papers and, and doing research, but as a human being who also has emotional and physical needs. So like look after the, the human behind the research and you will get good research. That's kind of what I think anyways. All right, I think I will jump in directly because I have slightly different opinion, actually. I, I, as much as I do agree uh, with you, Jamie, that the burden shouldn't be only on students, I also do not feel that uh, it is the institution to set up the, yeah, the care for, for us, for PhD students. I think that the role of the supervisor of the laboratory is to set up, let's say, healthy communication and healthy working culture, but not necessary to take care of us mentally. It maybe comes from the fact that I also um, yeah, evolved in the French society, which is very hierarchical and we do, re, don't have really, for, like our relations with supervisors are always very formal. So there is a distance though, I really had super supervisors, but there is a distance. So. And I do think that, first of all, it is our mental health. It is our well-being. So we need to take initiative. We need to take responsibility. We need to take it in our hands. And I think that building peer support, right? It comes from peers. It starts on the individual level. And I believe that the institutions should support those initiatives once they are more structured. But it's about us. It's about building peer support 
yeah, and I think that should come from the individual uh, force motivation. Yeah, I think like uh, uh, coming from like what you were saying, I think like I, I feel like I think that is like a different academic culture to, like in different country maybe because like uh, uh, back in here, like in the University of Sheffield, I feel really lucky that in the Department of Psychology in Sheffield, like it's very supportive, like the environment is very supportive, like the postgraduate society, which is like what Jamie and Jamie said about like it's student led. So they have like this coffee morning every week. And we, we also have like a coffee morning with uh, the staff like every every two weeks, like a bi-weekly bi meeting. And I think like it's really helpful, especially for me, which which is like very new, who is like very new in the uh, department. I don't know any of the lecturer. And then that helps me to understand like, okay, so this person is doing this and this is the lecturer in the Department of Psychology. And I think like, uh, that's what I feel because like when I'm thinking back, like back in Indonesia, oh, a voice. <laughs> because uh, thinking back like to Indonesia, like I think like it's a bit different culture, which is like, yes, as uh, Eva mentioned, like it's a bit hierarchical. So it's like, yes, they have to maintain their own like well-being. Uh, maybe like the supervisor will ask, but then like they have to be like professional with their own mental health. So I guess like, yeah, I think uh, every culture is has got like a different academic culture. And as uh, Jamie Coe has said, like it's, uh, it's a systemic way. And uh, I don't know like which one is better, but in my opinion, like I'm comfortable with my current like with my current situation because my even my supervisor is very supportive with my own well-being and i remember like in the first day of my uh of my phd like my supervisor made me like a uh, some kind of like welcoming party which like every people uh, every people in the lab just come and then we can talk like informally and we can talk about like our hobby talk about like our daily life so we're not always talking about like uh the we're not always talking about our PhD, our uh, study, our research, but we also talk about like our interests. And yeah, for me, like it, it is fun to have this kind of culture actually. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, Billy. I think, you know, on that topic, it seems like you all had slightly different opinions and different perspectives, but maybe the, you know, the thread that ran through all of your answers or the, the thing that unifies your answers is the idea that it's not on one group or one person to, to, de to defeat loneliness. You know, it's something that takes input from everyone to, to make sure that students are supported and, and not struggling in that way. So I think we'll have the answers from the last poll question now to see what the audience thought. Um, they should pop up on your screen shortly. The final poll questions. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people have said no, they haven't used the university's institution or mental health and wellbeing services. Um, okay, that's interesting. I thought it would might be higher that people had, but hopefully people have been able to use this as a tool for support then instead. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our panel discussion. I'd just like to say thank you so much to all of our panelists today, you know, for sharing your experiences and giving advice. I know talking about loneliness and admitting to being lonely is, you know, it's a sensitive topic and it's not one that's, that's easy to, to admit openly. So thank you so much for, you know, being vulnerable and being open and talking with us all today. I think um, in, in terms of the audience, if there's one message, there's, there's lots to take away, but if there's only one thing that you're able to take away, it's, it's please don't feel that you can't talk about your loneliness or please don't feel that you can't talk to people. You know, we're all going through the same experience in different ways, but we're all connected in the sense that we're all doing PhDs and we understand what each other are going through sometimes. So please feel confident to speak up. And if you are struggling, speak up. We'll actually be emailing out links for the university support offered by the universities of Sheffield, Manchester and York. And we'll also be emailing links to uh, Eva's platform, PhD Success, and Jamie's platform, The Messy PhD, after the webinar. So if you want to access any of those services, they'll be sent to you. And um, we'll now move on to the Q&A session so we can hear from you guys, the audience. Um, I'll hand over to our questions moderator, Robert Bagley. Thanks, Leona, and hello, everybody. Thank you for staying on until the end now. Um, 
for those of you who might have to leave on the hour, um, I might um, put our survey up uh, before you leave. Um, so I'll, I'll submit that into the chat and we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out for us. Um, but if you, uh, if you don't need to dash off, then that's excellent. And we hope that you've come prepared with all sorts of questions for our panelists. Um, so um, as of now, members of the audience can ask questions um, to our panelists. Um, so you can ask a question verbally by uh, using the, the yes button on the participants panel to alert me. And then when I call your name, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, but please remember to keep your camera off or you can submit your questions to the chat for me to read out to whom your question is directed. Um, so whilst you're, uh, actually we, we have, um, we already have some questions in. So I shall start with a question um, here um, from, from, I think they want to remain anonymous. Um, and I'm gonna start with a comment here. Um, I think that there is a thin line between being able to be alone with your thoughts, uh, with uh, interacting with others socially. The demands of the PhD may require one to be alone with their thoughts for a large part of the time, which others may read as leaving you to be alone over time. Over time, the balance between being with your thoughts and being socially active and accepted tilts towards loneliness. Is This is where it may become difficult to reestablish that balance for many PhD students. Um, and where they may need support. I don't know whether any of the panelists have anything to um, to add, add to those, those comments. Uh, Eva, please yeah, go ahead. I, I would just say it's so beautifully said and this is so true because yes, when we are in our creative work in our PhD, like we also need space to think, to you know, grow in our thoughts, but at the same time, it can be very isolating. And I remember myself when it was time for me like to write my PhD, to write my papers. And then there were friends calling me or I even had my birthday that time. And I just totally didn't feel like it because it was not even urgent yet to write it, but it just didn't feel good because I had to do that. So yeah, I think that there is really a, a balance to find. And I think that this is really not easy. So something that I would really recommend you in future and that really saved my PhD also is having regular hobbies or regular activities that you do every week, let's say, that there is some constraint, you know, subscribe yourself for, a, I don't know, for me, it was a dance class. And I tried to keep that one thing once a week just to be sure that, okay, I keep moving, but also that I go out and see people and I don't become a complete stranger uh, but it's a constraint as well but I think it's it's very important to keep this balance so almost like forcing yourself to keep the balance yeah I, I absolutely agree with that I always say like schedule in your rest time as if it's an appointment and it's an appointment with yourself like who could be more important than that um, and I think, you know, we are all highly intelligent people. We are, you know, if, to be in a PhD program, you, you are someone who obviously can think at quite a high level. And I think that's almost like that can work to our disadvantage sometimes because then we sit there and we overthink everything, don't we? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yes, 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 I yes. feel that place. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then we're, because we're creative, you know, we, we were taught, we're trained to be lateral thinkers, to think of all different scenarios. Then we create all these monsters and scenarios in our head as well, right? So, I mean, like what Eva said, like really, I think, schedule in that time to not be with yourself like schedule in that time to talk to somebody else and sometimes all it does all it takes is to have a conversation with someone who is also having those same thoughts just so you know like okay you're not crazy for like thinking those things or sometimes it's also having a like conversations with a friend who will tell you you are being crazy. Like I've had friends who said that because like I've created all these like thoughts in my head, sitting there overthinking, overthinking that those thoughts become my reality. And I need somebody to tell me like, that's not real. Like you are, that's not true of yourself. Like don't be so hard on yourself or whatever it is. So yeah, really schedule in that time. And it doesn't have to be an academic friend. It could be your family, your partner, some some friend from yoga class or whatever just yeah, talk to somebody else like like I know that 
it sometimes feels like, oh, no, 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 I need to get this work done or like, I don't want to interrupt my work schedule. But honestly, like taking that that break is better for your work in the long run. So yeah, force yourself, make an appointment with yourself, schedule it into your Google calendar and set reminders. <laughs> Wow, Thank you. Really like, <laughs> Jamie, I feel real. I feel related with you, Jamie, because like I'm a I'm an anxious person, and like overthinking is like I think like it's my forte. Like I always overthink everything. So thank you for the tips. It's also good for me. <laughs> thank you. I, don't know. I, think yeah. we'll, I think for the sake of time and getting everyone's questions in, I think we should move on to the to the next one if that's all right. Um, so apologies for the pronunciation here. I'm going to try my best. Um, we have a question from Alex Kreski. Uh, from Pranya Graduate Life Coaching. I'm sorry if I butchered your name there. Um, but uh, uh, his question is, are there certain individual traits or characteristics that make a person more likely to experience loneliness? And if so, how could PhD students use this knowledge? So I'll open that up to the panelists to answer. Uh-huh. Uh, so maybe like, uh, I think like I, I will talk as an extrovert because like I'm a very extrovert person and I think uh, extroversion can be prone to the loneliness more compared to like introvert in my opinion, because like uh, as an extrovert, like my energy is coming from talking with the other person, but unfortunately, especially during this pandemic, like it's hard to communicate with the other persons. And sometimes like I also think that, okay, the other person is my friend is also struggling with their own problem and uh, I shouldn't like bother them or maybe sometimes like what happened to me is like when I talk with the other person like the other person talks more than me so uh, I, I want somebody to listen but unfortunately like they wanted to be listened more than me so it's I feel like maybe like an extrovert person will be more prone to the loneliness compared to the introvert in my opinion so yeah. Thank you, Billy. Um, does any, anyone else have anything to add to that question? Eva, is that your hand up? Yeah, yeah, if I can. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, loneliness is a mental state. So uh, what does that mean? For example, for the people who experience long distance relationship, right? In the long distance relationships, well, you're not physically there with the person. Maybe you didn't even see the person for a month, for months. But you know that the person is there, maybe busy, maybe not calling, but it's there. Whereas where you're single and doing your PhD and then you feel well, potentially very alone. So I think that for me, it's a, it's a mental state and we can also learn to control this mental state. So um, for me, just knowing, okay, I feel lonely because those are the reasons you can, um, yeah, you can handle it better. And I think that as a PhD students, we do have many things in common. So for example, PhD students typically on the personality level are high achievers, for example, they are perfectionists. So we also set very high standards for ourselves, but also probably for our environment. Like we want to be listened, we want to be understood. Um, so I, I, yeah, so I think that like I would, say two techniques like always remember this comparison like you're not alone this is just how you feel right now because there is a bunch of people that care about you and think about you they are just not there uh, with you and the second thing is also yeah to expect less from from the others to be you know at your level I don't know if I made it clear but <laughs> thank you Eva um I think we might, um, unless, unless any of the other panelists have got something to add. Um, okay, so let's move on to our next question. And uh, again, apologies for the pronunciation. Um, Dirangu Nungjiri um, has asked, um, it has been quoted that many divorces, many divorces cases happen to PhD students if their partners do not understand. Uh, how is this statement true? Does anyone have any expertise on on divorce rates in PhD students? It's quite quite a niche topic. Yeah, I I do know that in my laboratory, and it was like maybe a bit of an urban legend. I am not. Uh, <laughs> I I didn't read in particular any research, but yes, indeed, like I saw in my lab, we were about twenty PhD students. Many relationships broke either during the PhD or shortly after. And like, 
in my case personally, my relationship it was long term relationship ended just after. And I think that there is really, you know, it's like one person that is doing her PhD and is like working, working and giving everything to the PhD. And then there is no balance because it's like this becomes more important. And then in my case, for example, I was saying, okay, the leisure, leisure that will be after, my life will be after. So if you are in a relationship, I think that this is a challenge really to find the balance and to not put off your life after the PhD. Your life is also happening during the PhD. So there are also people who do have children during PhD who decide for it. And I think this balance is possible to find. Though, yeah, I do believe that this is a challenge. Well, th thank you, Eva. Um, we've received a question uh, from Adinda Rachmanto, um, who says, hi, thank you for the interesting talk. I'm also just starting uh, my PhD during the COVID situation, plus a very dark winter here in the northern part. I also started directly after graduating my master's in another northern country. The problem that I face right now is I'm constantly feeling tired. That's I just thought a seasonal depression, but uh, then and now spring is already here. So also, um, so that also affected the research activities. Uh, I've been trying some suggestions that you mentioned before, but end up um, having not, not having enough energy to do it. Do you have any suggestions on how to target um, tar tar target those issues? Um, I would like to suggest to first, I know this sounds really obvious and I don't know if you have done this, but go and get a health checkup. Um, I was facing a lot of very similar issues in sort of my first or second year of my PhD. Um, and I was struggling with extreme fatigue and also insomnia. So like, I could just never like resolve it. Um, and it, it ended up being an issue with thyroid and that kind of thing. So like do first of all, go and check that out. Um, secondly, this, the sense of tiredness, I think is kind of something that does happen to people in the PhD. So again, you're not alone. And sometimes that exhaustion is kind of a mental exhaustion. I know, I know over the last year, just working for two hours a day would completely exhaust me. And I really want to encourage you to, to lean into that rest, allow yourself the rest. Um, I think it can also get really tiring when you are trying to rest and deal with that exhaustion, but then you're feeling guilty about resting, um, that can add to the tiredness. So you know, that's also something I'd really encourage to like, when you are resting, like allow yourself to fully rest. Yeah, I would definitely agree with everything that Jamie just said. I think that um, it's okay saying like, obviously go into the online classes, doing the coffee breaks and things, but sometimes like more is needed and they're like seeking help. It is like no shame in seeking help beyond going out for a 30 minute walk a day. I think that sometimes extra help is needed, but I do think that you definitely speaking from my experience and not alone in this. I think that it's been a really difficult time to sort of find that motivation, particularly starting on your own and still being sat in the room on your own trying to do it. I think that it, it is hard and it it's, can be exhausting and it is that sort of mental fatigue that Jamie just mentioned. So like, you're definitely not alone in experiencing this. I think a lot of people that I've spoken to have struggled to keep that sort of, keep that motivation going and that sort of spark that you have at the beginning when you're starting something new and this is really exciting. I think now sort of the novelty of the work and being stuck inside all the time and having your Zoom quizzes is starting to wear off and it, it is getting a little bit, you know, it's getting a bit draining. So you're definitely not alone in experiencing that. Brilliant. Th thank you, panelists, for all, all your very helpful advice. Um, we, we haven't actually got any questions from the audience in at the moment, but we do have a little bit of time left. And I actually had a question I'd like to ask to Billy, please, um, oh, because yeah. uh, you, Billy, you're, you're a musician and that's something I oh. share with you. Um, so I'd like to get your insight into what you think or what, what role you think music plays in, in terms of um, loneliness and maybe not feeling alone. I'd really love to hear your insight on that. Okay, well, uh, actually, like, I also do a research about, like, music and well-being, and I think, like, there is a lot of research saying that music is actually can alleviate, like, your well-being, it can increase that your well-being, uh, especially when you play the music, well, actually, you can use the music, but it two ways, like, you can play the music but if you're not a musician you can also like listen to the music sometimes like we choose the music like uh 
with the lyric that is very relatable with us. So it's like, it's okay to find like uh, the music that is interesting, that we like. And sometimes it's like a guilty pleasure music, but it's okay. Just like uh, use that, we, we can sing to that, we can dance to that. And yeah, I think like at some point of my life, I think when I feel really lonely or not lonely, maybe but when I feel like I'm demotivated, when I play like the music, I feel like, okay, uh, I can uh, I can do something actually. I still have my hobby and uh, it's really helpful to actually to play the music. But I know that it's not for, it's not for everybody because sometimes like uh, playing the music can be so evaluative too. It's like, okay, I play the music, but it sounds it sounds really bad. Like uh, I'm not a good musician or something, but and it will it will be bad for your well being. But just play and just don't think about it. Just express yourself, and I think like it's. Uh, the music, the power of your music is really amazing that it can help you. So yes, I, yes I definitely agree. <laughs> music has a healing power. So um, I think we will conclude with the last two um, questions that have been submitted on the chat, um, uh, just concerning um, be, being a little bit short in time. Um, so our, uh, our, our penultimate question is from Brandon O'Connell. Uh, and Brandon says, I'm a first year PhD student and I'm worried that as normal life returns and I start doing things outside my PhD, I'm going to become very conscious that I'm doing nowhere near as much work than I was during lockdown with no distractions. Uh, so, so to those on the panel who were also first year, who are also first year PhD students, have you felt the same way this year or thought how to readjust? I think um, like, yeah, I've definitely felt the same way. I've I feel like when I'm, uh when I was at uni for my masters, a lot of it would be spent walking to and from the coffee shop, chatting with people, getting a coffee, and then being like, oh, it's okay, I've done like three hours work so far today and half of it spent sat having a coffee. Um, but I do think that what, what is really important and what I, I'm trying to remind myself is that we're so much more than just our PhDs, like it is about that work-life balance. And when we are able to get out and have, like, have a social life again, uh, be able to go to coffee shops, be able to meet our friends, go out for drinks. I think that it's so important to have those moments of joy as well as have have work and what I try and do, and I'm still trying to do it now. And granted, it is a lot more difficult because what I try and do is work my nine till five. But when at five o'clock you're still sat in the same place, it can be really tempting to be like, oh, I'll just finish another article or I'll just do this. But I'm really trying to be strict with that with myself now so that when I'm back into that sort of being able to go into the office and seeing people that at five o'clock, I allow myself that time for activities to see friends, to like see my partner and have, have those moments of like happiness outside of work. So I think there's no need to feel guilty for that. We're like a whole person and not just what we do for work. Yeah, uh, I think like I, I also agree with that because when I did my master, I also, I think like most of my time I'm in the cafe more than like, I've been like uh, studying like in the library and also like in the cafe, like actually we can still study like in the cafe. And I, in my opinion, like when there is like a culture shock, there is always like a reverse culture shock. So it's like at now, like we're in the culture, in the pandemic culture, I can say, but after the pandemic, like maybe we will, feel like uh, shocked a little bit because like, oh, okay, uh, we have to go back like to our lives. So I know that we will, uh, I'm sure that we will have to adapt at first, but then like uh, every, every person will have like a different time to adapt. So I guess like uh, we have to, we have to be aware of ourselves, whether we are, whether we are like, uh, what is it? Whether we are, uh, comfortable with doing something or uncomfortable of doing something and maybe I add up also like because I just realized that the one who asked question uh, before called Adinda and I know that Adinda is like Indonesian name hi fellow Indonesian uh, <laughs> because like as an Indonesian like uh, I feel like there is a culture of like talking with the other person because we have like a collectivistic culture so I guess like talking with the other person talking about about like our problem when we feel like we have like this culture shock or like this reverse culture shock post the pandemic, we can always talk with the other person. When we feel unproductive, just talk, just talk with the other person that maybe like, a, maybe our friend can help us actually. Sometimes like we just keep it to ourselves, but it's actually like when we talk with the other person, sometimes that this other person feel the same way and we can find like the solution together. And I think that's what will I do post the pandemic? Because I, uh, as, a, as a person who, 
just do everything like in my room. Like I think I need to orient myself when I have to go back to the real world outside, when I have to go back to the lab and talk with my friends. And I think like it will be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Can I just jump in just really quickly? I know I know I know that I'm not I know that I'm not um, at the start of my um, PhD, but I just wanted to say that this this feeling of feeling that you're never doing enough work and, and kind of guilt for taking time off is something that PhD experience uh, students experience through their PhD, like with or without a pandemic. So I don't know if it's helpful for you to, to just know that other people do experience that as well. And, and you know, taking a break doesn't have to be a, a, a bad thing. Can, you can, I like to use the phrase constructive procrastination or pro constructive distraction, because I fully believe that even when you're taking breaks or you're doing other things and other activities, um, the, the thinking process is still happening in the background. And actually sometimes taking breaks and doing other things, you go back refreshed with so much more ideas, which can enrich your, your research in the long run. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, Jamie. Right, so let's crack on with our, our last question. Um, and that's from Albert Kwanza. Um, and he asks, uh, what does the panel suggest for managing loneliness when you have another care or parenting duty while trying to take care of yourself as well? Oh yeah, that's that happened to me too, actually. When I back in Indonesia, like I live with my parents and my parents, uh, well, they can, uh, fortunately, like they can still take care of themselves, but I still, as a children, like I can, I need to ask about like their days and like uh, ask about their something. And yeah, and I think like uh, we need to, in my opinion, like we need this kind of like compartment, whereas like, okay, this is the time for me to be alone. Okay, this is the time for me to for with my parents. And I know that in the middle of it, like sometimes like our parents, like our, uh, we need uh, like the urgent matters, so we have to take care of them, and it's okay. And I think like having this kind of like the time compartment is really helpful. And sometimes like yeah, it it it's, it is hard, but then maybe like we need to work like at night when our parents sleep. I know that this is like the sacrifice that we have to make, but I think like this is this will be really helpful because in my opinion, focusing our PhD for like three hours every day is like better than like uh, we just do everything like we we do like the PhD as like our side side part where we're we'll busy doing something for like hours and hours. And I think yeah, that's that's my suggestion, I guess. I'd like to just add on to that as well. Sorry, I'm really chatty today. Um, another thing, I don't have par uh, parenting or care duties, but just from something that I've observed in um, colleagues of mine who, who do have parenting and, and care duties is that um, you will establish your own work groove. I think over time, you'll find what works best for you. And what I wanted to say most importantly is that don't feel guilty for your own um, work groove and for finding what works best for you so don't compare to you know your colleague who's single and doesn't have any other responsibilities and can just focus like that's not helpful at all find your own work groove and just be okay with that and secondly I, I did want to say as well don't be afraid to to talk to the support that's available to you in your university um, some universities have like care carers networks and things like that who, who can give you additional support speak to your supervisor to let them know like what your sort of schedules are like and, and how you're able to work or not um, and that can be more helpful sometimes than you know. Yeah, I, I, think, I thank you. I think we've got time for one last contribution, if that's all right, before closing up the webinar, please. So um, who, who would anyone like to jump in on that? All right. Yeah. So or maybe I can just say, yeah, that what I have noticed also is that, yeah, first of all, having other obligations like family obligations, it also gives us the notion of purpose, okay? So it's like we have a higher purpose in life. So we have a purpose of becoming great researchers, doing our PhD, but also, yeah, having family, taking care of our pa parents, that brings balance to the equation. So this is, I would recommend you to see it as something positive overall. It also sets your time boundaries. So there is time for you to work and to work efficiently because your time is very limited. Whereas for people that do not have this obligation, uh, yeah, the time tends to extend or we tend to extend it. And then the other thing is also that maybe between your PhD and family obligations, marriage, there's a place, the space, the time as a, 
as Billy said, a compartment that you would need for yourself. So this compartment is like a mental compartment, of course, but it also means maybe changing the place. If it's possible in your country to go for a walk, for example, to be, you know, in a different place. In psychology, we also speak about having this third place. We have, we have work, we have home, and we have something else. It can be just a short walk, but this space, let's say symbolic space for you to find, to reconnect with yourself. Thank you, Eva, for finishing up that Q&A session. I'm just going to hand over to Davide to um, see the webinar to its conclusion. So thanks, Davide, and thank you, panellists, and thank you, audience. Well, thanks, Rob, first of all, for uh, um, moderating the Q&A session. Uh, it looks like we have come to the end of this webinar. Once again, uh, uh, thanks to all the audience for attending. Thanks for our wonderful panelists, uh, um, Eva, Billy, Jamie Ku, and Jimmy Jenkins, to taking the time to discuss this very important topic. And also, one big thank you to the CD team, Advanced Biomedical Materials, uh, um, for giving us the opportunity to create PhD discuss in the first uh, instance, uh, and to all the staff at the University of Manchester and Sheffield uh, to taking the time uh, and being available to share. Uh, this important uh, um, event. Uh, I will uh, uh, just share uh, one last thing um, on the screen. Uh, here you can see some useful links uh, um, for the University of Sheffield support uh, and University of Manchester support, uh, some uh, um, mental health organization in the UK, and also, if you scan this little uh, QR code uh, in the corner, you will um, have all the links uh, to our socials uh, uh, of PH Discuss. So uh, thank you again. I hope you have a, a wonderful evening. Uh, and yeah, good night. Thank you, everyone.